Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and you are watching The Digital Age. In May of 2012, the mega firm Dewey and LaBeouf filed for bankruptcy and closed its doors. Many said this was a result of financial missteps or excessive compensation to partners and partner guarantees. But we wonder, was it symptomatic of a larger problem concerning large U.S. law firms? Same problem uh, exists in Great Britain. With us tonight is a British lawyer and law professor. He is an expert on the business of practicing law. He is Richard Susskind. He is one of the world's, legal world's, most respected commentators on law firm practice. He has written a compelling new book entitled Tomorrow's Lawyers, in which he argues that lawyers must radically change their ways if they are going to survive in the future. Richard, we're delighted to have you back with us. Good to be with you again. Now, Dewey and LaBeouf, largest law firm bankruptcy in the United States history. Uh, $550 million in indebtedness, most of it uh, to banks. What went wrong? A whole bundle of things went wrong. Uh, partly, of course, the financial management, the, the leaders of the organization, how it was they took on board more and more lateral hire partners, that's new partners, and committed to very high salaries, very high incomes for them. And at the same time, and it's really one of my thesis, we're seeing uh, in the legal marketplace enormous cost pressures. So law firms have assumed for many years they would continue, as they did for, say, 20 years, every year an increase in profit and turnover, and made commitments that eventually, as the market has declined, they haven't been able to meet. This firm and its disaster are actually very specific circumstances, but I think it's an instance of a more general phenomenon that law firms are under pressure as never before. Well... Let's talk about the old traditional model mm. of the, the mega firm. Yes. Uh, the uh, uh, associates charge time to clients. Abraham Lincoln said time is a lawyer's stock and trade. Uh, the partners charge time to clients. Usually the structure was pyramidal. The partners charge less time. The associates charge more time. Uh, and they made a handsome profit. It was called leverage. They sure. leveraged from the associates. Now, what's wrong with that? It's under challenge. The point about this is that you had this uh, notion by many management theorists that the broader the base of the pyramid, that's to say the more junior lawyers one employs, the greater the profitability of the firm, the greater the leverage, the gearing, as you suggest. The difficulty is that clients are expressing deep concerns over cost. I call it the more for less challenge. Many of the largest companies in the world are saying they're under pressure to reduce their internal headcount, their legal departments. They're under pressure to pay less to external law firms. And yet, they've got more legal and compliance work to do than ever before. And what I hear again and again from them is that they really don't mind paying very high rates to deeply expert lawyers at the top of the pyramid. But they worry that at the bottom of the period, the junior lawyers, people not many years qualified, who are doing fairly routine and repetitive administrative and process-based work, that that kind of work could be done in different ways. And so the argument is that while the top of the pyramid is fairly safe, that broad base of pyramid is under attack. And what is happening is that new providers in the marketplace are providing alternative ways of delivering that routine and repetitive work. And this means, of course, potentially uh, a far greater uh, demand uh, for external providers and a far smaller demand perhaps for internal, that's to say, uh, uh, providers within the legal marketplace, the traditional law firms themselves. So uh, is this true of all kinds of legal services? I mean, legal services kind of covers a multitude of sins. I mean, you have uh, what you call the barrister, the trial lawyer who goes to court. You may have uh, an estate planner who uh, drafts your will. Uh, and then you have corporate lawyers. Uh, some of the work done by corporate lawyers is highly innovative, uh, highly creative. Uh, other work is kind of cookie cutter work. Uh, you get a lot of special pleading though. You, uh, very often after I've given a presentation, a, a lawyer will come up to me and say, you're absolutely right, Richard, the profession's in for a great shake up. What you see applies in every area of law except one. And then they'll explain to me why it is that their particular area of legal practice is immune from all the changes I'm suggesting. Of course, these changes will apply to a different extent across different practice areas. But I think it's important to say that it's not just very large clients 
right down to consumers. Around the world, we're seeing a reduction in public legal funding. So it's the case that uh, the more for less challenge, as I call it, the, the need to somehow deliver more legal services at less cost applies right across the spectrum. Within the big law, within large legal practices, I think you'll find that some high-end corporate practitioners will say, well, actually, my work in my language is highly bespoke. It's highly tailored and customized. Bespoke. That's uh, I uh, go to London and, Indeed. Uh, and buy a suit that's custom made for me. Savile Row. You'll Savile go Row. That's right. Someone will fit a suit around you. So own. how can legal services be bespoke? Well, the notion there is just as the suit would be handcrafted, tailored, custom fit for you in particular, the many lawyers regard their craft as similarly bespoke, that it's a highly tailored, highly customized service that can in no way be subjected to the routinization of technology or the standardization of the kinds of template documents that many firms are now investing in. What about the uh, culture of uh, the large firm and, and how that has changed? Because uh, there's certain firms that still have uh, retained that culture where they promote entirely from within. There's a mm. lockstep system of compensation uh, and uh, they make few lateral hires. Uh, and there was great emphasis on uh, loyalty to clients, service to clients, collegiality. Uh, and now uh, that's changed. There's much more emphasis on the bottom line. Well, many of these values remain in some of the greatest law firms and others have become highly commercial. And it's not for me uh, to suggest which is a, a better or, or, or worse approach. Uh, but I, I think we're seeing, uh, because of the commercial pressure, as a, an acute uh, sense amongst many partners of, of the bottom line. And this is leading, I suspect, to a more commercial and a less collegiate approach. The very interesting question is whether or not a small number of elite firms around the world will remain uh, much following much the model you suggest and will be unaffected by computerization, unaffected by the liberalization, which is something we can maybe talk about, unaffected by these commercial challenges because they do very complex bet the ranch deals and disputes. So that's to say if major clients have very serious problems, they probably will gravitate towards one of a very small number of firms with very good reputations, both the brand of the firm and of the individuals within them. And these firms, the argument runs, may not need to change so much. And the routinization, the computerization of legal work that I talk about in my work perhaps only applies to the second tier firms and firms below that are undertaking less critical work for their clients. Well, what appears I should say, that's not an argument I subscribe to, but that's the argument many very eminent law firms would like to promote. Yes. Well, what uh, appears to have been the case at Dewey and LaBeouf was the tremendous emphasis on the bottom line. Mm. In fact, it was uh, highly profitable for a mm. long period of time. Mm. Uh, but they went out and hired partners and offered them multi-extravagant, uh, multi-year guarantees. Uh, and then they found when business trailed off, they had to borrow money to pay the partners. That's and right. then they couldn't pay them anymore. That's right. And now, uh, is that... Uh, symptomatic of what happens when law firms don't uh, adapt to uh, uh, the new requirements of the marketplace? I'm not sure it's symptomatic. Uh, there are a number of firms around the world that have adopted this approach of lateral hires. You can grow organically, which means you'll actually develop and grow your partner from within, or to accelerate the growth of your firm if you don't want to merge, you can actually recruit high profile individuals from other firms. And to do that, you have to offer them extremely attractive packages and the guarantee of these packages. Now, as I said earlier, this is okay in boom times when profitability and turnover are climbing. It's not so good if actually the market stabilizes or declines and you therefore realize that you're committed to paying these lateral hires and have little left to distribute amongst your conventional partners. These conventional partners, traditional partners, will then move on to other firms and you can see the collapse happening quite quickly. So the lateral hire strategy is a wonderful way of bringing in new talent and hopefully new business, but it does often assume if you commit to high salaries to, to, uh, uh, to remunerating these partners in a, in a, in a very favorable way, it, it does really require the market to continue to flourish. And not having grown up in the firm, they don't have the same loyalty uh, to the firm as uh, the homegrown partners in, in the other model. I think that's true, but we are seeing far more mobility amongst many major law firms, individuals, indeed teams moving from one firm to another, sometimes because their own particular practices fit better with other firms on other occasions simply because the remuneration is better.
Well, it, uh, Dewey and LaBeouf, of course, they, uh, at, toward the end, when they couldn't pay these guarantees, they were plagued by partner defections, mm. which caused a decline in revenue because they lost clients. Implosion happens quite quickly in these circumstances. There's no doubt. I'm not sure the extent to which we should uh, fixate on that particular disaster. I think the more general issue is that law firms can't assume growth in the market development as they did in the past. And to be able to compete and meet clients' needs, they need to rethink the way they work. For many firms over the last few years, they've thought this is about pricing differently. So we'll move away from hourly billing, as you mentioned earlier, more fixed fee work. That certainly happened. But the bigger leap we need to make is from pricing differently to working differently. It's, to, it's not simply to change the way that one calculates one fees, but actually change the way you source legal work. This goes back to the point that the routine and repetitive work that's at the bottom of the pyramid needs to be done uh, in different ways. And that might involve sending the work to India to legal process outsourcers. It might involve the use of automatic document assembly. It might involve the use of contract lawyers. There's a whole bundle of different ways of sourcing legal services. But this changes the shape of law firms. And as law firms change in shape, then their profit profile will change. And they strategically need to rethink how they're going to organize themselves in the future. Well, do you think uh, big firm lawyers are expecting uh, too much in compensation for the uh, uh, services they deliver? I mean, are, are lawyers overpriced and given the needs of the marketplace? It's very hard to observe. I, I think lawyers can bring enormous value to their commercial clients. And indeed, individual lawyers uh, advising consumers can change their lives too in a way that's almost impossible to value. But in many ways, we leave this to the market. And the market determines the extent to which lawyers' fees are appropriate. And clients move to other firms if they think uh, their legal advisors are overcharging. And we are indeed seeing, uh, amongst major clients of law firms, far greater uh, inclination to move to other firms, to invite new ways of delivering services, to engage different forms of providers. And this is part of the, frankly, it's the market doing its stuff in law. For many years, it was a, a seller's market in boom times. Now it's a buyer's market. It's tougher times. And client is king and is actually beginning to flex their muscles. Uh, do uh, you have a view as to uh, the better compensation formula we see in some firms uh, the more traditional firms, every partner knows what the draw is of uh, all the other partners. Mm. Uh, Dewey and LaBeouf, they had a closed book. Mm. So uh, the partners in the, in the middle or at the bottom of the totem pole uh, had no idea what the extravagant draws were of the partners at the top. Uh, all of which came out in, in the bankruptcy. Do you have a view as to which model is preferable? It's a different model. One is lockstep, where basically you're paid according to the number of years you've been a partner. The joy of that is its clarity. Uh, you don't need a compensation committee to try and evaluate how people have performed, because the other model requires precisely that, that you make judgments as to the value of the individual contribution to the firm. And so you have committees and you have uh, locked doors behind which partners are sitting and evaluating the performance of the fellow partners, which can be fairly disruptive. I'm absolutely in favor of transparency. I incline towards lockstep because of its, its clarity and its simplicity. Although I do appreciate that uh, overperforming partners uh, who are perhaps younger don't feel they're compensated appropriately. But it really does have the virtue of certainty. It's consistent also with the traditional model of a partnership. I suppose when you get to a firm that's many hundreds um, of partners in size, uh, it begins to break down. And, and many would say it's a non-commercial approach. But I think it preserves the collegiality, which is important to many leading law firms. Well, in your superb book, you refer to uh, two kinds of pressures on mm. law firms. Well, I guess one is the economic pressure, which arose following the financial crisis of 2008. And the other is the digital pressure, mm. uh, because uh, so much of a lawyer's work was done manually or yes, virtually right. manually. Uh, could you explain what those pressures have been? And, uh, I, I, mean, I should say there's a third pressure which I call liberalization. And you yeah, may tell think, us about that. Well, let me jump to that immediately because it's interesting from the point of view of the United States and quite controversial. What we have in England uh, is a piece of legislation, the 2007 Legal Services Act, which was brought into force in 2011, which does a whole bundle of things. 
Uh, above all else, I suppose, it allows non-lawyers to be partners in legal businesses. It allows the injection of external capital, that might be private equity or venture capital, into legal businesses. And it allows... So law firms could go public. Indeed. Well, uh, they, we've seen that all happening uh, already in Australia. In many ways, they can uh, have capital brought into their business and going public is just uh, one option for those uh, uh, jurisdictions that permit that. Um, it's also possible in England to set up what's known as alternative business structures, ABSs, which is just a different kind of vehicle for the delivery of legal services. This liberalisation resulted from uh, endless discussion in England, I think very important discussion, that uh, the legal services market to some extent was anti-competitive, consumers, uh, clients weren't being offered sufficient choice, there were certain activities engaged in by lawyers that didn't really need lawyers, so the market was liberalised. And what's been fascinating since we've last spoken uh, in 2011 when this came into force is the new energy in the legal marketplace in England and Wales. Quite fantastic because it's not just capital coming into the legal marketplace, it's new people, entrepreneurs, it's high street shops, banks, building societies, all expressing an interest in the legal marketplace. If you take a step back, the legal marketplace in England and Wales is worth about £26 billion. Pounds. And you have entrepreneurs and investors and high street shops saying, actually, I'm sure we could deliver legal services to higher quality because they look at the legal market and they see that about 30% of law firms in England and Wales are sole practitioners. Now, this is a, a cottage industry, no economies of scale, no information technology, terribly old fashioned. So the retail outlets think, well, I'm sure many of our customers would prefer legal services to be delivered from our outlets. And indeed, this is what happened. And research invariably suggests that about two-thirds of consumers would indeed prefer to go to a standard high street retailer rather than to a dusty old law firm. So it's all terribly threatening on the one hand to traditional lawyers, on the other hand it's creating this wonderful new landscape where you have these new providers, these new thinkers, these new ideas about the way in which legal services can be delivered. So this is leading, for example, to the co-op bank uh, has decided it's going to be offering legal services from 350 of its branches up and down the country. And this is an entirely new way of delivering legal services. Or a very traditional firm called Knights, which was founded in the 18th century, has received an infusion of capital from a very well-known uh, private equity uh, uh, practitioner and uh, to rethink the way and to reinvest in the way in which they do a lot of the more routine aspects of large property transactions. So you're seeing this exciting set of new developments and this might be thought by many American lawyers to be specific to indeed an idiosyncrasy of the English legal marketplace. Uh, well, you've always been more idiosyncratic than we have. There's an element of that. Uh, I do think, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Scotsman, so anytime I praise English, you can, you can take it. That I can it really must read be Scotland. Worthy of praise. Yeah. <laughs> but, so in, I do believe the English law firms, uh, uh, in a variety of ways, have been more innovative over the last few years than, than U.S. law firms. But what's fascinating is that many U.S. lawyers say to me, well, that's just England and Wales, doesn't really apply to us. You had in your country the American Bar Association 2020 Commission, which I think to its eternal discredit decided not to allow liberalization, not to allow the setting up of alternative business structures. And it really worries me this, because and it's maybe not for a Brit to say, but when I look at the, the level of discussion in relation to this, for example, nine general counsel in the US said that only lawyers should deliver legal services because only lawyers were capable of the level of ethical standard that's required of the professional legal advisors. Now, I see no evidence, genetically or otherwise, why it is that lawyers are somehow ethically superior to other professional providers. Or more worryingly, well, in they're, some ways... Well, they're charged with abiding by a canon uh, uh, set forth expr expressly, canons of ethics. And uh, these same or similar canons are actually abided by, by many other professionals. I, I work a lot with the, the large accounting firms. It seems to me their principle-based uh, ethics is, uh, is every bit as uh, robust as uh, what I observe as the rule-based uh, approach of the, uh, of the law firms. But if you take another example, people in, in the U.S. have developed very impressive online services, pro bono services, to help people who can't afford legal services, and local bar associations have struck these down as the unauthorized practice of law. And what I think we're seeing, I'm afraid, rather than um, protecting access to justice and protecting the citizen, there's a lot of protection of the legal profession. Now, I'm so quite it's a form of guildsmanship. I mean, we're, of a sort. We're an ancient profession, uh, mostly unpopular over the centuries, and. Uh, 
uh, we protect our own and we uh, want it to stay the way it's been. That, that is the fear, I understand it. But you should survive as lawyers because you add value, you bring benefits that no others can bring. Not because you essentially erect fences and uh, regulate others out of the arena. Pulling up the drawbridge and saying only we can undertake these tasks seems to me not to be the answer. So that's, in a sense, the moral objection to anti-liberalization. The commercial objection is this, that what we will see, and we're already seeing, in England and Wales and Australia and other countries is the successful development of new ways of delivering legal services fueled by external capital, fueled by liberalisation, which will give insight to clients, to general counsel, to new ways of working that they will naturally ask of their US lawyers. And US law firms who aren't able to finance themselves in the same way, aren't able to organise the delivery of services in a way that liberalised regimes can do, will be, I believe, at a competitive disadvantage. So there are moral and commercial arguments, I think, in favour of liberalising. My prediction, incidentally, is that that decision of the ABA uh, will be reversed by 2020 and you'll have a liberalised market too. So in a liberalised market, will lawyers uh, receive lower compensation than they've been accustomed to receiving over the years? I think that's inevitable for most lawyers. Maybe not for those that the very uh, top of their well, game. Well, there's always room at the top. But. Always room at the top. But I think uh, lower down the pyramid that you mentioned earlier, it will become increasingly competitive. You'll have accounting firms, law firms, legal process outsourcers, supermarkets, banks, building society, all vying for the very substantial legal marketplace that exists in the, in the US. So inevitably, I think that will uh, result in a reduction of cost to the consumer, which is a good thing. But aren't you dramatically changing the rules for uh, a young um, college graduate who enters law school using uh, our system? Uh, I mean, I and others went to law school, I thought, because it was an ancient and honorable profession yeah. and uh, we would do things for people that they couldn't do for themselves. We uh, would be of service to other people. I think we're and now we're told uh, the emphasis is on the bottom line, and we have to become uh, uh, technical directors. We have to be proficient in uh, uh, computerization, and uh, that we're delivering a commoditized project uh, product which uh, uh, can be duplicated by almost anyone. And uh, it just seems to be uh, less pride and prestige in, in being a lawyer. Well, there's a lot there, Jim. I think the first thing to say is there's no reason why it should be any less honourable delivering legal services in different ways. There's no question, it seems to me, that the, the world I foresee in the delivery of legal services is very different. It's not Rumpel, it's not John Grisham, it's not Suits. It is a very different way of delivering legal services. Well, that services. will always be there, though, at, at, at the top. The, some of it may well be, but actually both... I mean, the, what does a man do who's charged with a crime? He retains the best barrister he can afford. Criminal's very interesting, yeah. and it seems to me it's less susceptible than many other areas of law to the kinds of changes I'm anticipating. But when you think about it, uh, the law doesn't exist there. It's not there to provide a livelihood for lawyers any more than ill health's there to provide a living for doctors. But you're not going to get any lawyers unless you're providing a livelihood. You may not get traditional lawyers, but there'll be other people who will be very interested in being involved in the delivery of a new form of legal service. My focus, therefore, is in the needs of the citizen, the needs of the client, rather than the needs of, the, of lawyers. And if we're absolutely honest with ourselves, Jim, if you look right at the bottom of the... Uh, of the legal marketplace, if I can put it that way, where you have consumers who are disenfranchised because of lack of public funding, who have no genuine access to legal services at all, right to the top where you have vast multinational organizations are saying they need to reduce their spend by 50%. Uh, we've got a broken system. We need to think of new ways of delivering legal services. You can uh, nostalgically look past in the honorable ancient profession uh, like the Rolls Royce, but we actually need something a little more practical, smaller, that uh, far more people actually can climb into and, and, and use. That runs and on a battery. It could well run environmentally far friendlier than lawyers have been historically. I have no doubt about that. So, so I think, you, you see, I think things like the commoditization of legal services, it's a word that's used by lawyers with a, uh, really through gritted teeth uh, as, as if somehow this, this lessens, cheapens, diminishes the value of what's on offer. But if we can't, let me give you an example, Deloitte, uh, tax specialist, in, in one of their very complex offerings, they've essentially distilled the expertise of 250 tax experts into an online service. 
the model is very sophisticated. It's a rich, sophisticated body of knowledge and expertise that they can now make available to their clients in a new way. And similarly, I think we'll have online legal services that will allow people to draft their wills, to draft their tenancy agreements, online services that will allow people, when they lose their jobs, to find out where their entitlements are. These will be sophisticated systems developed by a new generation of lawyer, and I call them the legal knowledge engineer. These are people who will take large bodies of law, fashion it, restructure, organize it, make it available online to help people who could otherwise not afford the law. I find that honorable. I find that uh, far more stimulating than one-to-one -one consultative bespoke service delivered to a very few who can afford it. So I find the future exciting. If law students are accept, expecting legal service to be as it was for their parents, uh, I think they're in for a major change. Well, just and like a major medical, surprise. medical students would feel the same way. They're I, not well, going to be practicing the same medicine that was practiced uh, 25 years ago. My next book uh, that I'm co-authoring with my son, Daniel, is on the future of the professions. And as I've looked, as we've looked at other professions, every profession is going through exactly the same uh, kind of changes. Uh, the world is moving on. Basically, uh, we cannot afford professional service as it's delivered as the bespoke one-to-one -one advisory service and we need to find new ways and the internet provides a wonderful channel for this of delivering access to human expertise. We can't afford it so I have a question for you Richard Go Susskind. On. Is there a future for tomorrow's lawyers? There is but it's not the future that most young law students are expecting. When I speak as I do to many law faculties they're rather stunned and shocked by this because they really did think it was about John Grisham or Rumpel of the Bailey. So when I talk about legal knowledge engineering or commoditization or standardization or uh, radical disruptive information technologies, the role of artificial intelligence. This is really not what most law students are signing up for, which is why I wrote the book, because it seems to me that it's not just uh, law firms that are changing, law schools need to change as well. We need to breed a new generation of legal advisor who works differently. People a new breed of legal advisor who works differently. That's marvelous. I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Thank you so much for coming by, and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. Good night and all the best.